You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 41. Where are all the wannabes? Wes and John interview two dental students who spent a week in our offices seeing what we do every day. Did they learn anything? Does dental education need to change? Or is the foundation we receive in school enough to get you started? Is apprenticeship still the future of advanced dental training? Or can you just learn it all on YouTube? We discuss it all this week on The Dental Guys. Welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. John, it's been another good week in dentistry here in my practice. And where are the wannabes? And what do we mean by that? You know, I think, you know, years ago, my dad and I talked about, you know, where's the next wannabe, you know, in, in whatever you're doing. And what we mean by that is interesting because, like, who's alongside of you? Mm hmm. And wanting to be you. Now, we all want to try to replicate ourselves. At least some of us do. Now, some people might not want to try to replicate what they're doing, but passing it on or whatever you might call it is apprenticeship or what we might call mentorship in dentistry dead. Right. Because for, Uh, for years, you know, you would go to a course and you would learn from the master, right? Right. Or... In, in you know in school you're learning from the masters all the time and then you go to hopefully CE and you'd learn from the masters but that's really changing and we're seeing that many people are not going to as many dental meetings anymore we're not seeing as many people attending hands-on types of things anymore and we're not seeing also as many people going into associateships anymore because some of the fault of the senior doctors who are not taking on associates, as we talked about uh, with T-Bone a while back, but also it's maybe the fault of some of the younger doctors coming out who think that they can learn without the need for that. And that was a lot of what we talked about on this on this uh, show. Interestingly enough, you know, I just finished listening to one of the courses at Spear Education. MTS Manji says that when we set our bar in our practice, that it is difficult, if not impossible, to bring someone on underneath you to even may reach that bar, but never to exceed that bar. That is so rare Mm. and highly, it's just almost unattainable. Yeah. So what, what happened here, John, is that we had two dental students contact us, Chris and Jeremy, and they just kind of threw it out there. Can we come down and visit Wes and John or shadow Wes and John in their practices. And what happened that week was was awesome. John, they it got was. to experience, I think, every facet of dentistry that there possibly is. Yeah, we and did a lot of stuff. We did a lot of stuff. And so the way we did that is that one spent, as one was spending two days in John's office, the other one was spending two days in mine, and then we vice, we flipped that and man, what a great experience we had. You know, we, we were kind of like, we didn't know who these guys were. Right. We Skyped them before and they seemed like they were really cool, but. Right. We you didn't know, know again, if they were serial killers. Right. But again, you know, here's <laughs> the thing is awesome. like, we met each other and we were kind of scared about, right. you know, John and Wes meeting each other. Just like, I mean, dentists are weird. There's man. some weird we dentists out there. There's some weird dentists out there. Yeah. So, so these guys uh, ended up being like a great, not only were they. Uh, really eager to learn and were wanting to uh, to take their work to the next level. They were also yeah. just really fun to hang out with and we were time. passionate. And we just enjoyed having them here at, at our offices and our teams really enjoyed having them as well. And really what we tried to do through this interview, which was already has already been recorded, we're going to play for you in a little bit, is we tried to go back. This was right at the end of the week. This was the last day. They were about to head home. Actually, they're going to take a little trip to do some camping and head home. And we just sat down over coffee and we talked about what had they learned over the week, what experiences that they had, and how does that 
affect their feeling about dental education, the future of dentistry, and also too, how does it make them, did it change anything about where they want to practice or how they want to practice? Because we feel like this is the, the kind of thing that if you're not doing this with somebody, whether you are the mentor or you mm. are the, the apprentice, whatever it is, whatever place you are, Wes and I have talked about this before, that you need to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you and better than you. And you also need to look for people that need a hand up and bring those people up, pull them up to as high of a level as they want to take it, because yeah. that is how we make our profession better and this how we the, also make uh, make make people see that we're about quality and not just about, you know, the quick money. fix. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's the thing is, is that we're we want dentistry to succeed, not as a profession, uh, we want it to succeed as, yes, a profession, but we want it to succeed for the patient. Right. Because if we're doing high quality dentistry that is research based, that is practice proven, and that is, is tested in time, mm -hmm. and you bring someone along with you and you put them by your side and you invest the time and energy it takes to show them what you know, in a very short period of time, you can take your 15, 20, 30 years of knowledge and just blow it into their brain and them learn very quickly why you're doing what you're doing. And from there, it's their job to kind of help take it up to the ne another yeah. level. Yeah. And, and really, you know, I want to give a shout out to Chris and Jeremy mm -hmm. for coming down and spending their time, their break, um, their, their time away from their family. Yeah. And, um, and with us because it was a great experience for them, I know, as you'll hear in this uh, this up and coming podcast here next. So, John, without further ado, um, let's get right into this episode. So we're live here in Knoxville, Tennessee, at uh, a great coffee place, John. I think like one of the things that I've been telling oh. you, I've been seeing you pictures on the weekend of these lattes. Coffee porn. Yeah, coffee porn. That's exactly <laughs> what it is, but you know that I like coffee. And there's a place in California, and actually it's spread throughout the United States now, called Blue Bottle. Yes. And uh, John and I went there a couple Yeah, we years. went to the original one, and yeah. then I went to the, I've been to the one in, in a couple, well, a couple, of, they have in a couple other what cities What was mind-boggling was that when we were there, we were like, let's talk to this barista. And mm -hmm. she's like an English lit, like yeah. major, or actually, I think, whatever, grad student yeah. at university, at Berkeley. Right, at Berkeley. And like serving coffee. And she's like, yeah, all the people here are artists. But long story short, I kept texting John these pictures of these amazing lattes. Yeah. And, um, and so I was like, you, let's just do a little podcast, you know, at honeybee coffee and i and in knoxville tennessee and i just want to give a shout out and john what did you think about your latte oh man i mean i've i've had i'm not i'm not at the level of wes <laughs> with coffee i mean I'm, I'm i'm aspiring to get there wes has taught me a lot about coffee so i'm getting but i'm getting there but i do know a good cup of coffee i do i've had a lot of lattes right in a lot of places and you're and a big latte guy i am i mean that's usually when i'm like testing a coffee place like i want to have a latte and i want to have a a drip coffee and I got this latte and I'm telling you I mean it you was you gave me the eye you gave me the eye I had one little bit of it right. and I was I just looked at Wes and I was like this is blue bottle level yeah and I don't know what all goes into it well, Wes knows what goes into let it me just I just this. I'm like I, I don't know everything but so I know that this just is just a little background on honeybee there's a, a, a gentleman here careful now don't he, get in yeah, the weeds yeah he, he Norris um, is the one of the owners of uh, honeybee coffee now and he is a dentist and um, and he started roasting and um, just a little background on him is that you know he just has a passion for roasting and I think that's what makes honeybee and you're gonna place. come down and roast with him is what I heard he's I heard invited rumors. me to roast before and so I'm gonna call him out yeah. right now <laughs> Norris if you're listening to this I'm coming I'm bringing some green beans and we're gonna roast coffee together. But, so so we've had an awesome week this oh, week man, right because yeah. we've we you know oh, just a quick quick background but you know we've been doing the show for a while now and We've had some great feedback yeah. from listeners who have called and it's or crazy. who have. It's crazy, isn't uh, it? Crazy. Yeah, like, it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird because, like, we even had the experience a couple weeks ago at the AO meeting where somebody at a booth was yeah. like using <laughs> our, us to sell product, which was interesting because they'd heard oh, our man. podcast. So we've had a lot of listeners reach out to us various ways and just say, "Hey, we appreciate what you're doing. Um, keep it up." But we had some really good interest from uh, some, some dental students from uh, uh, one university 
which will remain nameless to protect the innocent. Um, <laughs> just kidding. But uh, no, we've had some some real shout outs from from them who have said, you know, hey, this is some stuff that's really helping us. And a couple of the students approached us uh, several months ago and said, hey, this is going to maybe sound a little weird, but we would like to see if maybe we could come down to your practices and just see what you're doing in person um, one week. And Wes and I were, first of all, kind of like, whoa, this is crazy. Right. Should we, we do this? this? Are right. these guys weird? Right. Like most are, they, are they stalking us? Right. You like, know, but it turns out. We took a chance. The, we took a chance. <laughs> Skyped them. <laughs> and after. Like, and oh, after, no, one of them got a beard. That's right. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> should he shave before he comes? Right. No, John was like, I got a no, beard. No, I got a beard. Stop <laughs> talking about beards, man. Right. So, so after this last week, we can confirm that Chris and Jeremy are some stand-up guys. Oh, we have had an amazing yeah. experience. And basically what they did is they spent two days, each one of them spent two days at my practice and then two days at Wes's practice, and we kind of swapped back and forth. And um, we didn't necessarily design the schedule this week for them. We just said, hey, we just want you guys to see a normal let week. Let it flow. Let it happen, and, and then spend some time seeing what we're doing. And it's been a really great experience because I think it's been – it's, it's definitely been educational for us. Yeah. We've seen some things that we've heard about what their experience is like at their university, which we'll get to a little bit later. Um, but I think it's really been a great time of just saying, you know, hey, here's, here's kind of what we hope the show, not necessarily just as one thing, but we hoped, right, that the show would become something like this where people are actually, you know, saying this is helping me to want to learn more. What? It's helping me to look that, to try to do a better job. That's the type job. of feedback that we, we get on a, on a week, sometimes on a daily basis yeah. now, yeah. is that you're helping me, and I'm kind of humbled by that because yes. I'm that guy that needs help. Yeah. You know, I'm the regular dental guy out there in the practice trying to just take it to the next level every day. John and I met each other at a conference trying to take it to the next level and that's what we're trying to promote here is like take your dentistry up a notch and yeah. whenever these guys got a hold of their our podcast it kind of changed them yeah and and i'm I, i'm really thankful for that yeah because, so, so let, we want to welcome chris and jeremy so hi chris how's it going good to see you good to hear from you today and jeremy good to see you chris for why, having don't, us today. why don't you talk about uh, whoever found us and how you found us and tell us kind of your story about how you found the dental guys yeah so jeremy approached me one day and he was like hey man like my dentist kind of showed me this podcast i should listen to and i listened to it and i was like this is really cool stuff like i think you'll like it and you know neither one of us have really listened to a podcast before about dentistry at least I didn't even know they existed, honestly. Yeah. And, you know, I listened to a couple and was like, wow, like, you know, I can go in the next day and do some of the stuff that they're doing and just, like you said, take it to the next level immediately. Um, and then we kind of started spreading the word to other friends and, you know, slowly, you know, there's a little group that, that listens every, you know, every new so episode. So how many, how many students, uh, Jeremy, do you think uh, are listening to this where you guys are? I think there's got to be 30 Really? Students, yeah. Really? Yeah. Man, that's oh, awesome. That, that many. It's, I didn't even know that. It's gotta be. Yeah. yeah. It really has to so be. So when an episode comes out, like you guys listen to it and then you, you kind of talk about some of the stuff we're talking about as some, with some of your friends, like some of your close friends, like, hey, this is what we heard. Is that, does that kind of, does that, ha does that happen? I think there's a few of us that listen to the episode as it comes out. Yeah. And I think the remaining people are trying to catch up. Okay. Mm-hmm. But um, probably as in real time listening, there's maybe five people that are listening to, oh, a new episode came out this week. Let's gotcha. listen to that. And we talk about it all the time. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of our friends, one of our good friends, uh, you know, Cody, he, you know, he texts me every time he listens to a new episode. And is like, hey, man, like, did you hear this? Like, what do you think about this? Hmm. And we have kind of have conversations about that. So it sparks some conversations with your, you and your friends about, you know what we're trying what we're talking about and, and yeah. kind of how that applies to your education and um so has it has it changed the way that you guys are are doing i mean has it changed any from the educational standpoint um what has it done for you when you think about you know this is your last year of school so as a fourth year student how do you think this podcast or other podcasts could affect like what how your fourth year goes? Yeah, as a medium, you know, we think that this is a great way for us to kind of, you know, help people to realize that, you know, dentistry is awesome, dentistry is fun, and you know, people get their information from different places, and we think it's cool that podcasts could be a way to do that. And how has this helped? How has this helped you, right? 
Yeah. So in our last semester of fourth year, we don't have class at all. So some of us, like Chris and I, take time to self-educate, yeah. which I think is really important. And one of the things that I've learned from the podcast is self-education is really important. Mm. And so you guys are talking about new technology, new procedures that I've never seen. And it makes me and Chris think, oh, let's, let's research that a little bit. Let's see what they're talking about. And maybe we can implement that into our clinical lives. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. So you guys, after you've been listening to it for a little while, um, you reached out, and now that you've, you know, spent this few days with us, um, what are some of the things I guess that it uh, that it makes you think about mentorship? You know, we've talked a lot about on our show about how we feel that seeing procedures in person, having somebody talk you through things. Obviously, that the dental education environment is designed around somewhat that idea but it doesn't really always come out as mentorship and I don't really want to get into like you know the negative stuff about dental education today but I just want to ask you know how has this experience uh, and it helped you guys in terms of do you feel that the way that of uh, coming and seeing in a practice environment um, compared to what you're being able to do at school, you know, how does that how does that change the way you look at at mentorship and, and learning? Well, you know, I'd say the last time a lot of us have even shadowed in, in a private practice is before dental school, mm-hmm. and you just have you have no idea what's what's going on. Um, there's just no way you can until you actually start doing some of these procedures. So I think it's important that you know, towards the last, uh, you know, like where we are in the last semester of dental school to actually see what you know, a real practice is like, mm-hmm. and we understand what you're doing, so for some of it at least. So um, basically what you're saying is is that there needs to be some type of foundation, you know, that you've actually done some of these things, you right. actually know what you're seeing. Right. And I think you walked out of the operatory one, one time this week in my office, and you were like, you know, this makes so much more sense now because I know what I'm looking at, and I can actually oh, see yeah. what you're doing and see why you're doing that. So there's different ways of learning, and one of the ways of learning is reading a book, you know, and then putting that into practice and actually doing that thing and whatever that thing is. And so then, and then actually just doing that repeatedly yourself. But then there's what we did this week is basically looking over our shoulders and actually watching us perform you know, that whatever that is, whether, you know, it's a crown prep or an extraction or whatever. And so do you feel like that this week kind of helped, you know, you kind of see what, you know, what that type of learning could be like? I was extremely impressed by the attention to detail that both of you have. For example, you've cut crowns for a long time, yet you're still taking the time to refine the margins. You're using finishing burrs. And it's really made me think about my crown preps and how I should finish and I should be really attentive to the margins, the reduction and everything. And it's excellent to see you guys do that. And also when you just talk through the procedures with us, that's really great for us to hear. Hmm. And I say, you know, as, as dental students and dentists, like we're very visual learners. So, you know, we can read all the books we want. We can see pictures and you know, even videos, but seeing that in person, I think really, really helps and to understand the workflow and how you work with assistants because you don't see that, you know, in a picture or um, when you're reading the book. Yeah, and especially I saw a bunch of implant impressions. It's totally different seeing an implant yeah, I think you now know exactly. I was quizzing you by the end. Okay, is this closed tray or open tray? And I'm like showing you stuff. And you like, by the end of the week, I feel like that you know what a true closed tray, an uh, open tray impression is. And you've got some good principles to take home with you. So how seeing that and doing it, you know, now, how, how how's that helped you? It's so different seeing an implant impression on a PowerPoint slide versus watching someone do it there and actually understanding why they're doing it. I didn't know why why you do open tray, closed tray. I mean, we're kind of taught, but I've never seen it physically done, and it makes so much more sense, and I understand the procedure and why you're doing it this way. It's just mm-hmm. really great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's definitely the... You know the, the the difference. I think that both Wes and I have have learned some of the same way. I mean, you you know you get taught some of these things, but until you actually see it 
uh, happen, you know, it's, it's tough to translate what you see in a, in a journal or in a, uh, a PowerPoint into reality until you, you have somebody sit down and, first of all, talk through it. Right. Because I think that's the first thing is you have to say, look, this is what we're going to do. Right. And this is why we're going to do it. Because you can't just, the problem with video, for instance, is that oftentimes you, know, you see it, but you don't always understand the why. And that's what you know we try to do with the show is we try to say let's talk about the why we talk about the why a lot on the show you know we we say you know because people can't on the show watch us do it you know but they can we can say here's the research that supports it here's why we do it we can show some photos but then there's the other side which is that's all good but you still don't really know how to actually implement that how do you actually like manage the so patient is, so that? basically is mentorship the thing that dental school is maybe missing or even education from a standpoint of like beyond dental school like is the mentorship what you've seen this week is that kind of like what would you think would help make us better dentist as a whole absolutely yeah i mean i know that's a lot of things you know students look for when they graduate dental school is a mentorship position um but i think it's i think it's hard to find um so if we can try and get that into the actual dental school i think that'd be a huge help you know i, I would say that Jeremy and I have had, you know, a lot of luck in having great professors in our clinics, and we've kind of had that mentorship in our clinics, and we've learned a lot from, you know, a couple select professors. Mm -hmm. um, That's good, because I think that that, so they're doing some of that there. Right. It's just that in the more advanced procedures, I think, right, because you're seeing, you know, it sounds like you've gotten a good background with the more basic procedures. Right. It's just how do you take some of the things we talk about on the show with like the more complex dentistry unless you do you know a pros residency or an endo residency you know how do you learn how to do good molar endo or how do you learn how to do a hybrid um yeah it's you can't learn it on a powerpoint you know you no. just can't I, is, do you guys feel that's true i mean it's i knew hybrids existed but i had never seen one i had never seen them taken off placed on and I finally saw that. I think dental school gives you an excellent foundation of the bread and butter dentistry, but when it comes to the advanced things, I think mentorship can really provide a positive atmosphere. Yeah. And even for bread and butter dentistry, yeah. I think it's good for you. Like, you know, you all talked about packing. You saw us pack cord this week. You saw us use laser for curatage this week. You saw us use it in different ways. You saw kind of us making decisions clinically on the fly about why we would do certain things and talking you through that. And when you see somebody doing that on a day in, day out basis, it starts to become more relevant that the bread and butter dentistry, there are decisions that you're making bread and butter wise that impact you on these larger cases too. Mm -hmm. And like when I would necessarily maybe pack cord, you know, may not be, you know, the same as when I'm doing it on a veneer case or something like that. Mm -hmm, right. And, um, or it may be, you know, and, you know, you learn from that bread and butter dentistry a lot to helps you in your more complex cases because, you know, a single unit crown prep, you know, your single unit crown preps, and then you start looking at full arch dentistry, those are just a bunch of single unit crown preps, but just all in a row. Yeah. And, and bread and butter dentistry makes you a better comprehensive dentist. So do you think that um, knowing what you guys have seen here and knowing what is out there a little bit maybe more from the show and from what you guys have been reading and from all of that, do you think that a four-year model of dental school, kind of like what you guys have experienced, you know, do you think think it's enough that it's enough i mean and and and, and if and if it isn't enough which uh, you may say that um do you do you think that uh, what's the what's the solution you know what's the solution as far as you guys can see to trying to get people ready for private practice honestly i think i think a four-year education is sufficient in dental school mm -hmm. but i think a one-year extended residency either a gpr or a gd is something that should be done. I feel like you learn how to do fillings and you learn how to do some denture work, but I think most students should do a residency. And I think certain states have already adopted that you have to do a residency. Yeah. And I think Chris and I want to be better and be more skilled and learn as much as we can. And that's why we're both doing residencies. I think a four year 
could work if you were somehow able to get rid of the stuff that just doesn't really matter. There's so much that goes into, you know, just we're taught because we have to pass certain tests or get certain requirements checked off that it just doesn't really make an impact to our, our future education, how we're going to practice. But, you know, we understand that it's, it's just, that's, just how the, that's just how the system is. And I, I don't know how you can fix that because you're always going to have that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of why we, yeah, like Jeremy said, we decided to do it an extra year. It's not because we're uncomfortable with what we're doing. It's just that we want to get that extra advanced training. Well, both of you will be paid, you know, a very low salary next year. Um, and I, mm-hmm. I did a residency and, and, and you were paid a very low salary. But the advantage of doing a residency is like, wait just a second here. I know, a gigantic truck. We're going to have to edit yeah. that out. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Seriously. So, um, a residency, I feel like, gives you an opportunity to make some mistakes, to get your speed up, so that you're not forced to produce so much dentistry to be able to make a living with maybe a debt over, you know, riding maybe the type of dentistry that you're doing. And so there, there is a lot of talk about a five-year program right. and eliminating some of these tests that – could be given basically in five years. Basic, well, yeah. But let me just say though, like the other side of this, because I didn't do a residency. Right. I know. And, I know you did. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna play devil's advocate here, okay? Because I'm gonna say that I think that that's not the solution. Okay. Now I'm devil's advocate. I get exactly what Jeremy's saying. Exactly what Chris is saying. Totally get it. But I completely disagree. I think that when we, if you guys listen to the show when T Bone was on, and and I think you could probably tell. I didn't agree with a lot of things T-Bone said. I can say that now because he's not here um, because I don't want to, like, you know, get an argument with T-Bone. But I did agree very strongly with what he said, that if every dentist would take on an associate, now not his model, okay, necessarily, but I think if every dentist took on an associate and looked at it as a mentorship, that it could solve the problem in dentistry of us diluting the profession down to the lowest common denominator. And I think that my situation, when I got out, I had somebody who did mentor me. And that right. was why I didn't do a residency. So I didn't do it because I didn't believe in it. But I feel like if if we could get dentists to, in general, be trying to increase their skill level and be trying to get better, and that's probably problem number one. But if they were at so, that point and then they said, let's take some young guys in and let's mentor them for a year, that I think could be even maybe more valuable because I would say there's residencies where you're doing you're sewing up oh, faces. It's dude. terrible. You're sewing terrible. up faces All right, for so a year. Here, so I would I will say there's some bad you, residencies yes, too. But it's impossible. And I'll tell you why it's impossible. Yeah. yeah. Because the mighty dollar. Yeah. The mighty you're dollar right, right. supersedes what quality we're trying to do. Your your situation is rare. I agree. And even today I think it's even more rare and you guys will probably back me up on this, right? Is that <laughs> is that trying to find what you all saw this week. Let's say that you become associate Jeremy or Chris in one of our practices. You can imagine what type of training you're going to get in one year's time. Sure. It's going to be epic. Yeah. You know, Amazing. it would yeah. be unreal, unprecedented training and the ability to come in. You if I told you, "Hey, look, you want to get better?" come in on Mondays on your day off, you would come in because I know that's oh, the yeah. kind of quality you are. Right. The, yeah. the problem is, though, Chris and Jeremy, is that we don't have the type of people with the passion that John and I right. do and your dad did. Right. Because I'm going to say your dad, Absolutely. I know him, he had passion. Absolutely. He forced you to go to the AO. Right. Well, because he knew that would make you a better dentist. Yeah. I know. Of. Well, I'm sort just of. saying. Sort <laughs> of. But I mean, I know the type of, da- yeah. you know, the dentist that your dad was, you know, and he was in a different, different time. Yeah. He was trying hard. He was, he trying, was trying hard. hard. And I agree. It's a dream world I'm living in. And I know that. Yeah. So I'm just saying that I wish not, that that world existed. Yeah, but I it wish doesn't. That it, existed. it doesn't. So then you got to say, okay, what could really make this work? Okay. Right. And so is a five year program a really an optimum situation? So I think that you could fashion a five year program to be something like kind of what I experienced in my five year program, Mm -hmm. a private practice model five year program. We know that there's less money for education than there ever has been. Okay. So every time you hear about funds getting cut, funds getting cut, but the prices keep going high. We're paying more for it. You're paying more. Right. Okay. So why is that? I don't know. But let that's for another day. But if funds are getting cut, you all said some of your favorite professors were the people that actually come back part time 
oh, yeah. and, and give their time, but they have actually been out in the real world, okay? So if you can imagine in that five-year program, if you had a private practice model five-year program where you had, it was built-in mentorship. That's the type of program I'm talking about, yeah, John. A yeah. built-in type mentorship that's required. Yeah, because I know like where I went, the people that got out and went to GPRs, I'll tell you what they did. I know. They went to the hospital. I know. They saw... They, they sewed up faces. I agree. They saw people with mental disabilities, see, and they that, did full mouth sedation dentistry. They did IVs, and they took out impacted thirds. And they that's were a, interns, that's a stepping oral stone surgeons, and that was not program. a useful program but, for them. But I'm not right. saying they're all like that. I'm they're, just saying they're that not they, all like that. That has to a also lot be of them at. are. A lot of them are, and a lot of times AEGDs are just a fifth year of dental school, and yep. it's and 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 that's just the way it is. But there are programs out there, and I think if we fashion a program that maybe really allowed people like Jeremy and Chris to really hone their skills but also be mentored and yeah. not be pressured to have to produce an income. And, and allow those dentists that are in the community that do have that passion. Right, like to you bring guys people have seen in. the part-time faculty who that's why they're doing it. They're not getting paid very going much. To they a just really want to do it. Like ours and and doing a year mentorship and not being required to actually produce dentistry, doing some dentistry. You have a license, you can practice, but you don't have to produce. I think that that could be an option. And I yeah. think it's a blend of what we're talking about. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. we agree, but we also disagree. Yeah. And and Yeah, I I know that what I'm saying would only work if people would realize that what's happening is is that they're the problem is with the dentists that are in private practice right. that don't care. Yeah, it's, that's, it's, that's that's the problem. problem. If if that's, that was better, we wouldn't have this problem right. we're in right now of talking about residencies because it would be like apprenticeships were right. for the last thousand years oh, yeah. Yeah. where you would say, Hey, you want to be a watchmaker? Dude. We're gonna show you how so, to be a watchmaker by doing it and watching we, a master and learning yeah. and doing it. So case in point is when we saw them doing those marble inlays at the Taj Mahal. Yeah, yeah. How many years did it take the apprentice? Yeah. It was he, like 20 he said some 20 years before you become a master. A master. <laughs> now, let me just say right now if you start at age 13, they said they start at 13. Yeah. They're not a master until they're 33. Yeah. I'm 39 years old, and John and I will tell you that it took us 10 years before we really felt like that we knew what we were doing. Yeah, in a you lot know? of ways. In a lot of ways. Not saying you can't know what you're doing at one year out of dental school, but I'm telling you to be a master, to have the passion, to do it and do it predictably. Okay, so let's change tunes a little bit yeah, here because yeah. we've had a little debate, which I like to have a little yeah, debate about education and how we can make it better. What we want to know from Chris and Jeremy is what have you all seen this week? Yeah, and, and what have you learned? And what have you learned? Chris? I've learned um, how important it is to have awesome assistants. Mm. I think both you all have assistants that probably know more about dentistry than I do. And, uh, I mean, that's impressive. And it makes your life so much easier. Um, just makes the day flow easier. Give uh, us an example of what you saw this week. Like with as far assistance. as that, yeah. I mean, when I saw uh, Wes do an extraction immediate implant, um, his sis assistant just, I mean, she knew what he was going to do before, you know, he did. And everything is just ready, right there for him. I mean, he didn't have to move his head, take his eyes out of his loops. It's just right there in his hands, and bam. Uh, I mean, just it's so efficient, so fast. And, Jeremy, you got to see my assistant with that implant impression, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about that. I I'm amazed that the assistants can take off the abutments. They have everything ready. It's like... They know they for sure know the pieces and parts of implant dentistry more than I do. <laughs> That's for sure. And it's really I honestly didn't know that existed. Mm. I really didn't know. That the assistants could do that Correct. kind of thing. And okay, I so I didn't yeah. think that it was something that they were even allowed to okay, do. Okay, let's yeah. talk about that because yeah. I think that's important for our listeners to hear is that most of the time dentists don't take the time to train their people yeah. so that's number one yeah. okay you just don't take the time to train so like if you're listening to this right now you're hearing chris and jeremy saying they just made our life a lot easier and it makes our practice that more efficient so one thing we can do is we can train our assistants what's within the law mm -hmm. as long as they're not doing something that's permanent and irreversible right in the in our state and in 99 percent of all states right then we can do it now they're not taking you never saw once then put a final cone in a root canal or take a final impression, did you? No. No, no. but you saw them put 
who made the doctor decisions? Wes and John did. Right. Right? We checked the verified right. that the pressure coping was seated. You all, you saw an impression coping that wasn't seated. Right. And, like, it took me and Megan to get it seated, didn't it? Yes. And we worked together, and she said something's not right here. She mm -hmm. knew. She mm -hmm. was trained. So assistants do make our lives easier. And I'm going to encourage every dentist, and I know John will too, is that you need to train and find a good assistant that's trainable. Hire, hire for personality, but train for skill. And if you can't train somebody in 90 days, you need to get rid of them. Because of beyond 90 days, they're just not going to get it. Yeah. You all saw me have trained an assistant, new assistant. She's about six months in. She knew nothing about dentistry. What did you think about her? She's coming along fast come along yeah. fast but how much time and john even i told john man i don't know if i want to do this you know mm -hmm. because it is a lot of work and yeah, a, lot a lot of time training. a lot of time and a lot of training well, you can tell she wants to get better she wants to learn all this she's we you know, figured she's, that out and within yeah. 30 days we knew within 90 days we knew she had it mm -hmm. and i've even seen wes your assistant is six months in but you're continually teaching her mm. every procedure this is why we're doing it and they even ask questions. Oh, okay, so why are you doing it this way? And they're and not then, afraid, right? And then they're ready for the next time that you're doing that That's procedure. Right. They're ready. They already know. Yeah. All right. So what's yeah. something else, um, you know, that you guys saw this week? I thought it was perfect example of why you need a camera. Mm, I forgot about that. I didn't even – both of these guys are saying every new patient pictures. I see Wes – present a treatment plan to patients of cases of, of their mouth of other results and I'm sure that helps to um, convince oh. patients of certain treatments awareness yes That's the word you're looking for awareness right and um, also pictures that you can give to the lab to help them uh, fabricate some sort of prosthesis yeah mm -hmm. yeah we were using you know we, we did a lot of shade photos this week and you know uh chris yesterday you know we had a patient who we were doing a uh class five little bit of decay on a lady with a dry mouth that i've talked to about you know hybrids for years and we then found decay on on uh, uh an abutment tooth for a, an rpd mm. and and what did that turn into like what it what happened next in that like do you remember what we did next with that patient yeah you could just talk to her about the options of you know, we can keep going down this path, but this isn't a good path to go down. Um, yeah. And then we put some pictures up. Yeah, yeah, pictures. Of hybrids. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the same kind of thing, you know, it was... Models. Yeah, yeah. you got to, yeah, we pull out, and my assistant, you know, she's immediately, like, she hears me going down that road. Mm -hmm. She's got a model of a hybrid for me to put my hand on immediately. We've got photos going up on the screen of a case. Um, yeah, so that part of that's the assistance and part of that's the importance of photography. So basically what we would encourage anybody listening is that you would say, Jeremy and Chris, is that they need to purchase a DSLR camera. I agree. Yep. Yeah, and so huge. Um, one of the things that we'll do in this show is that we'll put up what we use um, on a day-in, day-out basis, and we'll put links to the mirrors and the retractors that we use. Mm -hmm. And because I think it's very helpful that you take pictures and you create awareness with your patients. And, you know, one thing I talked about, you guys, is, like, create a portfolio. Mm -hmm. right. I think I was talking yeah. to you about that. Yeah. It's like, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about what you think a portfolio would be for a new dental student and maybe somebody that's going out into a residency or private practice. What would you do? You know, I guess any, any big cases you do, or even, you know, in dental school, since you're not doing a ton of big cases, just good bread and butter dentistry cases. Yeah, so it doesn't Show. start with big cases. It really right. just starts with your just simple crown and bridge. Like right. you saw us take a picture yesterday of Filtech Supreme bulk mm -hmm. fill versus new the new Filtech Supreme one, yeah. and we did a, a basically just some simple occlusals. Mm -hmm. But just one of those pictures, how would that sell? The, the value of that dentistry and, and treating grooves, you know? Mm -hmm. And so go ahead and, you know, a light, you know, tell us a little bit more about like what you want to do when you go into your residency as far as with photography and a portfolio. Yeah. I mean, I just want to take pictures of basically anything and everything I can. Um, and I hope that I have the opportunity to do that um, because I want to show my future employee, employer or, you know, wherever I work, you know, this is the kind of cases I got exposure to. Um, this is the kind of quality I want to do. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I, I know T-Bone brought that up. Again, going back to that episode, you know, he said when he's looking at an associate, he's thinking that was, a, and I think that that was something that I kind of hadn't really thought I about, really to be thought honest, about until T-Bone. Right. So credit, credit to him on that, that it is a good way. You know, you think, how do you find somebody that you know is passionate 
you know, and how do you convince, you know, maybe you're looking at an associateship after school and you're saying, well, how do I differentiate myself to show that I'm not just somebody who wants to clock out at five o'clock and go home, that I really do care. And I think being able to come in and say, hey, here's some stuff I've done. Um, what, you know, this is what I'm interested in. I'm interested in getting better. And this is some stuff I'm proud of. And this is some stuff that I think is pretty good, but I, I'm, I'm trying to get better at this. Um, I feel like that's, I mean, as if I was hiring somebody and they came in with that, I mean, I know for me, I would be like, wow, this is the kind of person that I want to work with. Um, and you know, it's funny, we were driving up here today and Chris and I were talking about that. And he said, you know, some of the dentists that he's talked to are like, oh man, don't be that guy. Come on. And I'm like, that's the problem with dentistry is that you got people who say, don't be that guy. Like what being does that, that mean? Being that guy means that you just care. Like, don't be the guy who's like, you know, oh, that's going over the top. No, no, no. That's just being passionate about it. It's the thing that we really want to see. Um, so, so Jeremy, what else did you like? Was there any, tell me anything else that this week that you really took away? This was the first time I had ever scrolled through a CT scan. Mm. I've seen them in a book or whatever, but I've seen how to manipulate them, mm -hmm. how we can use them for endo, or mm -hmm. we can use them for implant placement. Mm -hmm. We can determine how wide the bone is, how long the bone is, and it's really highly accurate. And I thought that's an essential part of a practice. I can see how that would go a long way. Well, yeah. well, you just said something that was pretty, pretty, pretty important there. You said that a CT is essential to a private practice. Mm. That's a pretty big statement right there. What you're saying is that you can't practice without it. Are yeah. you saying that? Put me on the spot. Yeah. Okay, Chris. <laughs> what do you think? About yeah. What do you think? I think it really, really helps. Um, I had no idea you could see, you know, MB2 on ACT and see the exact canal anatomy during endo. I mean, that's, you know, that's amazing. Um, yeah, and we saw some cases. We were looking at a case where we had a, a girl that had two missed canals. Yeah. And now we're having a year and a half old treatment of endo that's failing on two teeth from some other office that uh, because they missed that there were two canals on the distal root of first molars on the lower end. You could clearly see them on the CT, and and so I think it's a I think it's a loaded question. Was it is asking, right? Yeah. Can you I, practice? I, I mean, Gordon Christensen says you have to have access to a CT. He doesn't say necessarily you have to own one. Right. But I think I would agree with that statement that you have to have access well, to a cone beam CT. Again, we keep hearing it over and over and over. You know, Jeff Lombre said one of our one of our mentors out at Spear said that it was the most indispensable practice tool that he has. We've heard uh, Picos recently say at a conference that he said that he takes a CT. Now, he's doing high-end cases now. We'll say that. He's doing a lot of surgery. But we've heard him say he takes a CT on everybody. Justin Moody, he takes a CT on everybody. Every new patient that I'm seeing right now that has a lot of restorations and previous root canal therapy is getting a CT. And I'm not saying every single patient walks through the door is getting a CT, but I'm saying that a lot of patients in our comprehensive cases are getting a CT because we want to know if we're going to put a crown on that tooth for sure, if there's any inf any pathology going on, because full mouth series, they get it done some to the most part, but they just don't see everything. And so for you to say, Jeremy, that it's an essential tool, um, is a pretty big deal because you had just some limited exposure to it and what it could do for your practice. And John and I just really recently incorporated that into our practice on a full-time basis yep. in the last 18 months. And, and we have truly seen, if you ask John and I what our two most independent tools are, one of those might be uh, the cone beam. I will tell John that right now that I could not practice without it now. And I, and I was sending a lot of my CTs out anyway, and he was too. But it's just one of those things. So, so Chris, uh, what, what else have you seen this week that really kind of maybe helped you? How important it is to have a good relationship with your lab. I mean, I think I, the four days I, you know, we were shadowing you guys, I think you guys each called the lab every single day at least once. <laughs> yeah, It was in some true. kind of communication. <laughs> that's true. And, um, you know, whether it's talking about a case or even I saw John just call and just say, hey, man, who, who did this? You did a great job. And, you know, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's something that, you know, we, we harp on all the time on the show is, you know, again, if, if you're going to do dentistry at a high level, you just have to have a great lab. That's part of your team. I yeah. mean, it's indispensable tool is, is that person. And you let patients know that, Hey, look, there's a person behind 
this crown or this veneer or yeah. this reimplant restoration, and they are just high quality. Yeah, people. and you know, and you know, these are the people that are making. I couldn't do it making without, it happen. I couldn't do it without my laboratory. I just yeah. really couldn't do it, and I and I couldn't do it without the type of communication that that we have there. So, so what about you, Jeremy? Uh, what el- what else have you seen? You and I went through a bunch of cases for a traumatic tooth extraction and immediate oh, yeah, dental implant. Yes. And mm-hmm. you were so gentle on the tissue. The tissue is the issue, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. And, and so I didn't, I didn't fully understand the whole idea with a, a traumatic tooth extractions because a lot of the people that we treat at dental schools don't value their teeth as much. Yeah. And we come here, and Chris and I were just talking about how surprised we are that there's not very many extractions being done. Mm. And I think that was eye-opening. And also, you are incorporating the value of teeth to all your patients. And they're, over time, they're understanding that more and more. Yeah, we talked about that this morning kind of before the show, and we said, you know, it's kind of true. You know, I, I used to do a lot more extractions just because when I started, you know, I had a lot more patients with a low dental IQ and a low value for their teeth. And then, you know, you over the years, you just kind of naturally select that happens in your practice if you're talking about kind of weird. I didn't even think about it until they said that. And, yeah, and I mean, you're still doing extractions, still but doing you're typically them. putting an implant in or you're yeah. putting something in if you're taking a tooth out and you still have those patients that, that you're still trying to yeah. build that trust with. But in general, we find that people are saying more yeses and less noes. And you got to have treatment. that too in the beginning. If you're trying to build a practice, you got to be a little more open to just taking out teeth. And because and that is a, a good moneymaker because there's no overhead. Sure. I mean, I'm not sure. saying there's no overhead. It's a great skill to have. It's a great skill. And, and yeah. I'll encourage too that if find a place where you can go learn to take teeth out and donate your time. Because yeah, yeah. there are practices like ours where it might be a little more higher end, and we've made it that way on purpose, where we're not just doing full mouth extraction all day long and taking out teeth and taking out teeth and taking out teeth, but we're doing other things. And find a place where you can volunteer your time and hone your skills and make each extraction at that extraction clinic as if you were going to place an implant. Make it atraumatic. I was talking to you about tearing tissue and things. If you tear tissue versus cutting it with a scalpel, which is going to hear, if I tear my skin, you know, how is that going to heal? It's not going to heal well because it's jagged edges. But if I take a cold steel and cut that place, it's going to heal very well without a scar. And so it's the same thing in the mouth. Is like if you want to have good results, learn to take teeth out atraumatically. If yeah, you, if you and want it, to call it, it that. goes right into your implant practice. That's exactly. You know, if you learn that well, then that's a you're starting yeah, essentially. That's the first step to a good implant is understanding a good extraction yeah, and Justin preserving Moody says soft like tissue and bone. The same thing is he says basically you need to learn to take out teeth really mm-hmm. well before you even start thinking about placing dental implants. Yeah. And and once you've honed that skill. And you can take it out without breaking the buckle plate. Like, I can't remember the last time, knock on wood, I am even going to say this, that I broke the buckle plate. <laughs> Next the, Monday. Right. Yeah. And then I've lay, had to lay a flap. You know, yeah. when you say that, like, you don't lay flaps, Wes? No, I don't lay flaps. I don't lay yeah, flaps. You try not to. That's what Dennis Starnow says. You know, he goes, I love his lecture about it. He says, uh, he says so if I tell you that I'm going to, you know, cut your pinky off, but then I'm going to reattach it. And when I reattach it, I'm going to do it atraumatically and I'm going to suture it really well and reestablish that blood supply. And he's like, man, he's like, what would you say to that? He's like, that's what you're doing when you when you strip the tissue off the bone is, you know, you're, you're cutting off the blood supply. And yeah, you're going to put it back right. and you're going to get blood, but you're going to lose something along the way. He's like, so no more flaps, no more flaps. And he makes everyone raise their hand in the lecture and promise. And these are mostly oral surgeons, yes. right, John? Yes, mostly oral surgeons. And he makes you raise your right hand and say... I solemnly swear that I will not lay flaps anymore on my extractions ever again. And, you know, of course, we all know that you can't always do that. But his point is well taken. Right. His point is well taken. You strive to do that, though. So I want to change just one more, one more kind of direction on this. You know, you've seen the way that we practice. You've kind of seen how our practice is run. And you've seen a little bit about the areas that we practice in. Um, what has that made you think about in the way that you would look at where you might want to practice after you finish your residency? I think, so basically we're talking about a city versus a rural area, and I can see that the systems are basically the same, and I can see that the dentistry is basically the same, but 
the amount of marketing that has to do with a big city versus a rural town. Mm-hmm. I think one of the major things that I've learned that if you're in a in a little town and you're doing excellent work, the population around you will start to recognize that and are more likely to come in and see you versus in a big city where you have maybe a few guys or girls doing excellent work. They have more of a... a providers to go to mm-hmm mm-hmm what about you Chris yeah I mean growing up in you know a smaller town that was kind of the feeling that uh, we had with our dentist is the dentist knew everybody you know he's respected part of the community um, so you, you know he's just a, a member of society in your town and uh, that's kind of the, the feeling you know when I saw with with John's practice and um, you know going in and, and just you knew the backstory of all your patients um, and, that, and that was cool to see and it just you know a good example of you know small town dentistry do you think that most of your classmates are looking at that or do you think that a lot of them are wanting to go into the bigger cities and if so why do you, what do you think their motivation is right now like what is what is it you know because we're talking about for you guys you've seen it now but do you think that that's the way that most dental students are thinking I think most dental students are trying to stay in the big city. I think a lot of the students try and stay in the city of our dental school. Mm. And it provides uh, a little bit of a problem because there's not as many job openings. Yeah. And for me personally, I can see the value in... in Say uh, that again. Yeah, for, for, say, for, for me personally. For me personally, I can see the value in uh, going to a rural area. I'm not saying a big city is a bad thing. Just uh, a rural area is the kind of place that I'd like to go. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, what do you think the reason is that the dental students are looking at the big cities? They're like, what is it, what is the thing that they see in the big city? I mean, that's where your friends and family usually are. And there's just, I guess there's more stuff to do that. You know, I don't know how many of our friends really love to go to be out in, you know, the wilderness and be in a rural area where you can do more kind of outdoorsy stuff. Um, it's more people wanting to be in the city. They want to be able to, you know, go out to nice restaurants and bars and uh, have shopping around and just things to do. Gotcha. So it's um, more about access to this stuff yeah, that you can yeah. do in the big city. Do you think that they realize there's a difference between big city dentistry and small town dentistry do you think that like is anybody talking about that really or do you think that they they don't really know what they've what they're kind of asking for sometimes well sorry i actually don't think most people know that i don't think they think there's much of a difference between big city dentistry and rural dentistry Hmm. i really don't and i'll say you know a couple people that i know that are staying in the area they, they might be living in the city, but they're ha- you know they're commuting 45 minutes to an hour outside the city mm-hmm. um, because that's where the you know the jobs the are. opportunities are the opportunity yeah mm-hmm. it is okay mm-hmm. well you know we've talked a little bit about that on the on the show too you know we had in fact our just a couple episodes ago you know you guys have probably heard us talk about that with Russell Kirk and Corey Glenn that you know there's a there's a debate on that and it, it's uh, it's interesting to just hear from dental students about. Because we've seen that changing, you know, we've seen more people wanting to go into cities. And I think younger people in general, there's this whole influx back away from the suburbs. Part of that is the big word here, gentrification, you know, right? Going in, knocking down the old rundown areas and building the condos. And it's kind of like reinvigorating the cities, which is really cool. I mean, yeah, you know, I took we're, you we're to big downs- fans of that. I we're sitting to da- in it. We're, we're sitting, sitting here at a cool a old call- downtown coffee shop. It, this area yeah. probably 10 years ago was where... You would Dude, not you would go. not come here ten years ago. I'm not joking you. You would not come on this side of town because, and literally, if you go just a few miles that way, it's places you would not want to go. Yeah. But if I, I took you downtown to kind of show you like what downtown Knoxville has turned into in Market Square, and you were like, "Dude, this is cool." Yeah. It was really it's cool. cool feel. And that there's a draw to that coolness, and and that's that's good. I'm glad cities are doing that. I'm glad they're doing yeah. revitalization and all those things. But what we're saying whenever it comes to dentistry is that, and you know, I practice in a suburban area of Knoxville, and when I opened, there was that was a two-lane road, and now look at it. Mm. I knew it would grow that way, but I didn't know that it would like grow 
that way like that way that big that fast in 10 years it's like totally changed and you heard uh, Russell Kirk on the episode Big City versus Small Town where he talked about the same thing yeah he went to a a small town and it grew towards him and now it's like big city right and and i think you have to make a decision because i advertise i have to advertise because i'm competing against other people that there's there's a few people in my town that are doing high quality stuff i'm not going to tell you they're not and i have to compete with that and i have to be okay with that and i'm not saying you can't go to the big city and do it it's going to be harder though because people are leaving these smaller hometown places and I feel like that I want to encourage everyone that's listening to really look at the rural areas that are maybe an hour, hour and a half outside of a bigger metro area. You still have access to some of these nicer things, but you might have to drive on a weekend to go down to town. It might make it a little bit inconvenience for your husband or wife to work. But, man, could you just not crush it in a small town right now? I, I mean... My financial planner was telling me about some of the people that are just crushing it in small towns, and I just have to work that much harder, John. Um, I have to work that much harder to encourage every single patient that I'm better than the other guy down the street. And it's, that m- it's definitely different, you know, and, and it's not, again, that you can't be successful right. in the I'm big not city. You can. I mean, there's people that are doing really well, but I think, I think it's especially for the new grads. You know, it's not, you know, if you've been doing it for 20 years, you've got an established practice in the big city. Um, you're probably doing okay. But the difference is, you know, if you want to retire at a reasonable age and time, if you're getting out as a new grad and you're going out and you're, you know, uh, Chris was telling me about somebody who was offered, you know, a $70,000 base salary and, you know, starting and then we'll give you, we'll bump you up a little bit over time. And I'm thinking, okay, that's a hygienist salary. So there's yeah, that. You just heard that, right? Right. Yeah. So a hygienist is making that. Uh, in in not like a crazy big city and I'm thinking okay so not that that's bad like maybe that is what you the the price you're going to pay in order to do that but how how do you then what if you go to a small town and you're making three two to three times that maybe I don't know maybe you are maybe you're not it's not a guarantee but how much closer can you get to your goals so much faster right. in having more time and having more money and having more freedom and being able to maybe design your practice how you want? That is maybe the difference. It's not that you can't get there in a mm-hmm. big city. It's mm-hmm. just that there's a lot more you have to deal with and think about. And I think it's only becoming harder and harder because the, of the, the push toward bringing people back to these big cities which is a wonderful thing and again i love them like i love coming down to the big city and hanging out it's wonderful right but in the end it's definitely something again you new grads need to think about and or even if you're a few years out and you're kind of like maybe you'd feel like your practice is more stagnated you know it's important to look at that and realize that you know maybe this is the place for you maybe it's not it's definitely changing, I think, though, in the way that with the competition level. It is. It is definitely. You know, I I, I want to thank um, Chris and Jeremy for having the passion that they have because I think we saw it. John and I talked about this is that you guys, I mean, you, you encouraged us. Yeah, for uh, sure. Because I, I did. I said I wrote, I'm encouraged about our podcast. Yeah. Because if this is what if – if you guys are the only guys that we influence, and I, and I hope we influence more – to take it to the next level, then we've succeeded and it's yeah. worth it because that that's what we started this. That's why we started this. Maybe there's somebody out there and they're listening to this and they just want to, you know, take it to the next level like we do and have passion for dentistry. Yeah, not everybody wants to do that. That's fine. But we want to encourage people to do that. And if you're, at, if you're listening to this right now and you're at Ohio State, I'm encouraging you. I'm giving you a shout out right now to be like Chris and Jeremy and <laughs> take right. it to the next level and, right. and you guys uh, I and really tell, appreciate and tell, this and, and tell people about it like these guys have done you know if you feel like this is useful for you and it's something that is encouraging you to be better at what you do you know tell people about that the way that we get you know our message out to people is through you know social media mm-hmm. and one on one conversations about hey this is making a difference just like they learned about the show from people that they knew and you know we're excited about where this is going and we're excited to get it's to crazy. do this kind of thing yeah. so interact with us give us some feedback tell us what you're thinking about the show if there's things that we can uh, cover that you want to hear more about 
Um, if you want to, uh, you know, if you're at a university and you're, you're kind of struggling with some of these same things, let us know what your experience has been. I'd love to hear from people from other universities. We actually just heard from somebody from NYU yeah. yesterday sent us a message saying, yeah. They found us learn, on YouTube, yeah, and they're like, oh, my about goodness. This. You know? So it's, it's exciting to get to do that, and yeah. I feel like this is where we can influence the next generation of dentists is you know, at this point in their career where they're trying to think about what kind of dentist do I want to be. Right, right. And, and that is what we're all about on the show. That's it. And so if, if there's one thing we can say you know, to, to dental students that maybe listen to this, or even if you're far along in your career, it's never too late or too early to take it to the next level. Oh man, never so, too late. So for uh, for Wes, for Jeremy, for Chris, for me, we are the dental guys. Yeah.